I'm setting up to film an episode today and I uh, got to see a female laying some eggs on the milkweed. These four plants are humble, but they are they are attracting the females. Got an egg right there. And we got one there and uh one there. Yay! I'm Rich Lund, just a guy trying to help out some monarchs, and if you are rearing North American migratory monarchs, I got two questions for you. Before I ask either of them, and they're going to come one at a time, I want to make sure something's clear. If I'm ever asking questions in the way I'm about to ask, it's never in a judgmental, intrusive way. As my dad likes to say, I'm not that guy. What I've tried my best to do throughout the entire Raising Monarchs series, I try to show my methods, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, what pros and cons I've found along the way and what info I'm consulting in order to make the decisions and choices that I do. I've never really been about, you must do this, or you should never do that. I mean, besides some of the obvious, right? I think that in the rearing of monarchs from wild sourced eggs, there's many different responsible ways to do it, and people are gonna need to make their own choices and decisions. I would just ask that they are informed decisions. So my asking of these questions isn't to make sure you are doing something you must be doing, but to give you something to consider if you haven't yet. Okay. Here's the first question. Come late August, how much outdoor environmental exposure are you ensuring that your chrysalides are receiving? Winding back a bit, in June of 2019, a study came out from the University of Chicago, and it showed rather effectively, among many other findings, how vital outdoor environmental cues are for the developing monarchs in order for the emerging adults to come out with its instinct for migratory behavior to be activated, so to speak. Now, I put out two videos that summer in 2019 that discussed this study and what implications it had for those of us who rear wild sourced eggs all the way to adults and then release. Both videos, the one on captive rearing and migration and the other outdoor rearing, they have links in the description below. I felt that study was quite encouraging for those of us who do what we do, rearing wild sourced eggs that we find to adults and then releasing because that study did the same thing. And they showed that as long as they are receiving enough outdoor exposure, that yes, wild source eggs that are reared, they are able to have their migratory behavior intact and ready to go after eclosing and letting their wings dry. Now with that in mind, shown in the outdoor rearing episode, towards the later half, I know it was kind of a long one, I show an outdoor monarch pop-up tent. This outdoor monarch pop-up tent which is used in that episode specifically for showing where I relocate and hang some chrysalides for outdoor rearing. Well, I do think it's worthy of a closer look and it's actually gonna lead into the second question. Let's face it, when the news broke about the importance of outdoor environmental cues on the migratory monarchs, I was quite spoiled with a screened in porch. As that is already where I was relocating each chrysalis, um, ensuring that they had enough outdoor exposure was kind of a problem I had accidentally already solved. But still, for that episode, I wanted to devise something for the many who did not have a screened-in porch. And nowadays, well, that includes me. As described in the outdoor rearing episode, these mesh pop-up tents are readily affordable. Many brands exist, and I'm not here to endorse or review any particular brand. But I bought this, not the contents inside, but just the tent itself, for $10 back in 2019, and check in with today's prices of 2023, it's like $13. Now again, different brands, some have different features, uh, this one's got a, a zipping opening here to the mesh that's on all sides except for the top being a plastic one. And I prefer the, the top side, the plastic side, being the roof for my enclosure. It keeps out most of the rain when the plastic is the roof. And while this isn't as important for the chrysalis situation, for the rearing of monarch caterpillars in these tents, I do also like that the bottom side is a mesh portion. That way, if any water does get in, it's able to drain out, not pool. Now I've attached some tool then with safety pins on the side to the mesh, so that way the tool gives me a place where I can hang the chrysalides in an easy, convenient way, using the binder clip still. Bricks are on the inside and on the underside, both to weigh down the tent and also to keep it elevated, again, so any water that might be in there could drain. Without a screened-in porch, what problems has this solved for me? For starters, it answers that first question. And again, there are different correct answers to that question, but it answers it for me. 
how am I ensuring that I'm giving my chrysalides during that stage enough outdoor exposure? Well, this is giving them the same amount of outdoor exposure that was given to the wild sourced egg monarchs in that study that still were able to show their migratory behavior. Next up, the mesh size, as long as it's small enough, like the one I've selected here, keeps pretty much any pests and predators out of the situation. If a chrysalis is out in nature, even if it's the nature of your backyard, it is subject to all the risks that are out there. Wasps love to make a meal of the occasional chrysalis. Go ahead and do your own Google search to see the horror pictures that exist. And there's plenty of other risks too, I need not name them all here. You know they're out there. Also, I've always just been a fan of relocating the chrysalis anyway. If you're letting a chrysalis remain where other caterpillars are still being reared, well, it might be a rare experience, but some caterpillars have been known to take a nibble on a chrysalis. And indeed, if you're leaving them in there while the adult is trying to eclose and emerge out of that chrysalis, well, you don't really want a fifth instar caterpillar trying to figure out where to J-hang while that's going on and disturbing that very delicate time. Certainly by relocating them here, I solve any issue of a caterpillar disturbing the chrysalis at any stage of it. And then lastly, there is another great benefit to an enclosure like this. And it answers the second question, which hasn't been asked yet, so let's ask it. In however you are housing your chrysalides, what happens if your monarch falls during eclosure, specifically prior to its wings fully inflating and drying? When an adult first emerges from the chrysalis, its wings, as many of you already know, are not already fully formed. They kind of look crumpled up. And the abdomen is full of a fluid that is going to eventually be pumped into those wings when she decides to start that process. She'll pump that fluid into her wings when she's comfortable to do so, and they need to spread and dry and be pretty much undisturbed during that time. Now one thing the monarch has on its side is that it gets to choose when to start pumping up its wings. It can hold this off for a little bit if it needs to. But a requirement of this is to pretty much be hanging while doing so. It doesn't have to be fully upside down, could be even just hanging at least sideways. But a monarch adult on the ground trying to do this, it's usually not very successful. And needless to say, if the wings don't form right, the monarch's likely not able to fly. Now I showed in a video way back in the day that a chrysalis that's on its side is able to have the monarch eclose from it and be able to pump its wings fully. But even so, in such a situation, the adult monarch still needs some option as to where it can climb up and be able to hang a bit so that way it can spread out and inflate the wings. In the rearing of your monarchs, should your adult emerge and fall during that eclosure sensitive time, have you given any option for that monarch to be able to climb up and hang from in order to properly form the wings? Now I'm willing to fully admit, this is not a very common problem. But still, the risk is there. It does exist. And when it happens to that one butterfly, just that one, it can be heartbreaking. In our pop-up tent, that the bottom and the sides are all that mesh that gives a great place for the monarch adult to be able to cling onto and grasp. It ensures that no matter which direction they try to start doing it in, that monarch is going to find a path to be able to climb up and hang from. Dare I say it, it's an ideal enclosure enclosure. Okay, and I don't know about ideal, but it's a pretty good one, and it's solved a lot of issues for me. Now, let's bring another container into the discussion. Plastic terrariums. Monarch butterflies are obviously the number one thing I get questions on. Milkweed is number two, and these plastic terrariums have got to be number three. Many brands exist, and once again, I am not here to endorse or review any particular product or brand. The history as to why these ever even showed up in videos was because I already had some for transporting mice when I feed my python, and admittedly, they were pretty convenient for rearing caterpillars. For outdoor rearing, I don't use these so much. I use the pop-up tents. But again, that's only for late season monarchs. If it's not that late season, I wouldn't see anything wrong with still doing some indoor rearing using them. They are convenient. And also overpriced, my goodness. I really try to only pick them up when I see them at yard sales or also try asking pet stores if they have any used options of these. Sometimes you can score them at a decent price. But how do we answer that second question from the perspective of one of these containers? What if during eclosure, during that sensitive time, it falls? Whether it's plastic or glass walls, monarch adults are not really able to grasp smooth surfaces. I'm not saying it can't ever be done, but it's a lot harder to do. In the comment sections over the years throughout plenty of videos, it's come up from time to time about some monarchs not having their wings fully formed the correct way due to a fall in such a smooth surface side enclosure. Enclosure. 
And it's simply just due to the adult not having an option for something to climb onto. Well, if that's the situation you find yourself in, here's two quick options that maybe you wish to consider. Similar to mesh siding and its graspability, paper towel. With a length of paper towel hanging out the side and the lid placed on, with that slight modification, should an adult fall, it easily has an option to be able to cling onto and if need be, climb all the way up back to the top. Either case, you've given it some options as far as where it can form its wings. Or, simpler than the paper towel and even more cost effective, stick. Placing even just a stick, giving it some options as to where it can cling onto, will ensure that that monarch has a better chance just in case it falls. It's just a little bit of insurance. I do want to thank the monarch rear enthusiast Donna T for kind of recommending parts of the elements that went into this video. She brought up that health issue about the monarch falling during eclosure, and I agree, it was something worthy of mention. And I really want to thank you, both newcomers and veterans, for your interest in the monarch butterfly and for all efforts that you're doing to help them out. And if you hadn't thought of these ideas yet, hey, I hope you take them into consideration. I'm Rich Lund, and I'll see you next time.